I, I did, did uh, write a message that uh, because of the unpredictability of electricity in Damascus right now, you are on battery power. Yeah. Is that right? I am. And according to my battery, I have just over an hour. But I know that Zoom um, drains it. I, I turned everything off when the electricity went off to try and keep it. <laughs> well, we'll do what we can. I think we should get started. Yeah. Uh, I'm Henry Lowendorf uh, with the Greater New Haven Peace Council. I'm the chair of the local chapter. And uh, this webinar is being sponsored by the Greater New Haven and US Peace Councils and the Hands Off Syria Coalition. And we are really pleased that we are able to have a live discussion and presentation from Damascus uh, from Vanessa Bealy, uh, a journalist who has, uh, has been in and out of Syria for the last four years, as far as I know. We met yeah. <laughs> on a delegation four years ago. The US Peace Council organized the delegation and Vanessa joined that delegation to do some fact finding in Syria. So that's, that's how we met. And you have uh, since then been reporting and analyzing and um, uh, creating waves and uh, dealing with the repercussions of trying to get the truth out about what is actually happening in Syria. So perhaps we could start right away, if you could describe quickly why you were in Syria, given the background from uh, the war there and the background of the war briefly, and then um, maybe also say something about life in Damascus at the moment. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I I do think it's important for people to get a sense of what uh, what life is like. So if you could just give us some background to get started. Well, I mean, the background could potentially take about three hours to fill in. Um, how to condense this down? Well, I mean, I think we have to look at the recent events. I mean, although, yes, I can go back to 2011, I can describe how the Arab Spring was an entirely orchestrated um, and engineered uprising using um, extensively the Muslim Brotherhood, which has long been a battering ram of the US um, and UK intelligence services to overthrow um, governments that don't comply with US and UK policy, particularly in the Middle East region. Um, but I think we need to come forward really because I think people need to be updated with, with more recent information, which I think then highlights what I'm saying about the last 10 years. Um, in the last few months, and in fact, since um, 2018, of course, this war has been maintained largely um, on the humanitarian pretext narratives. And um, the major one of those narratives is of course the chemical weapon attacks, the idea that um, President Assad, uh, we're back to the sort of um, the, the good president or, or, or the good rebels and the bad president narrative. This is something, this is a familiar playbook for any regime change operation being um, run by US and UK intelligence globally. Um, but of course, what has underpinned the war in Syria has been the dodgy dossier of the chemical weapon attacks. Um, and that there we find parallels to, of course, the weapons of mass destruction um, in Iraq that took us to war in Iraq, um, the incubator babies in Kuwait, the Benghazi rape stories in Libya, um, the lists are endless. And so if we come to 2018, March 2018, when the Syrian Arab army and allies were in the final um, stages of the campaign to liberate eastern Ghouta, the eastern suburbs of Damascus from 
armed group occupation dominated by groups like Jaish al-Islam and al-Qaeda. Now, at this point, of course, there was the now infamous um, chemical weapon or alleged chemical weapon attack in Douma, just as in reality, Douma was about to be liberated from Jaish al-Islam, one of the most brutal um, sectarian armed groups of the conflict um, funded and sponsored and promoted by the US coalition. And that includes um, Israel, Turkey and the Gulf state. Now, at this point, there was an alleged chemical weapon attack. Coming forward now, um, we discover that in fact, the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons that was tasked to investigate this chemical attack, um, its final conclusions and its final reports were found to have suppressed and omitted crucial evidence from experts within the actual OPCW and the investigation team in order to align the report with their backers and sponsors, the backers and sponsors of the OPCW, who had, of course, um, unlawfully bombed Syria on the basis of this alleged chemical attack. Um, then, of course, we've had the recent um, leaks of UK Foreign Office documents that demonstrate that since the beginning of the war, the UK intelligence um, crossing over with the US intelligence have effectively been um, rebranding, whitewashing, um, pinkwashing, any kind of washing you can possibly find, all the armed groups inside Syria. Now, those include Al Qaeda, they include ISIS, they include the Free Syrian Army, um, and a, a raft of documents has been released. Um, those documents were written up by um, Ben Norton at Grey Zone. Um, people can go and read that article. Um, the, uh, the documents themselves were verified later by Dominic Grubb of the UK Foreign Office, who said that, yes, those documents are quite um, verified, but of course they were um, stolen from our website by Russia. So rather than actually saying, you know, isn't it horrifying that we've been offering media um, sponsorship, support and promotion of extremist armed groups that are effectively the US coalition proxies um, being deployed to invade and overthrow the Syrian government um, for the last 10 years. So I, th I think, you know, while of course I can go back over very old ground and I can go through um, all of the early fabrications in the war that, of course, um, sold the idea of overthrowing yet another um, government on a humanitarian pre pretext, manufacturing consent by Western uh, media outlets, etc., such as CNN. Um, I actually made a film, a documentary with Syrian um, documentary maker Rafik Latif. Um, two years ago now, or we finished it in 2019, I think. I lose track of years. Um, and that actually demonstrates all of the early fabrications by CNN, by Al Jazeera, um, by Al Arabi, by all of the media outlets that were effectively embedded in Syria and were um, supporting the groups that, that, that were providing um, the anti-government narratives and also providing the narratives in the West to, as I said, manufacture consent for yet another regime change war. Well, that's a, <laughs> it's a lot. And I know that, that there, there, are, there are certainly people who would say, how can all of these different media outlets be coordinated but the fact is as you pointed out that the weapons of mass destruction in iraq was accepted as uh the truth for a very long time and the some of these other things that you mentioned were accepted and promoted by these media outlets for a very long time Without Not actually only the media outlets, I think it's important to make the point that organizations like Human Rights Watch, um, Amnesty International, that have basically have a revolving door 
um, with intelligence agencies, particularly in the US, but also in the UK, were also responsible and pushing these, these fraudulent narratives in order to uh, manufacture consent for further intervention, military adventurism. Right, right. So it's, it, uh, we, are, we are awash with one particular perspective uh, and it's as, as you are for certainly familiar and I am familiar as well with how difficult it is to get out a different perspective that, um, that does not comport with what we are constantly being told that we have to believe. Mm. Um, I'm, I think within this context of the, of the, the demonization of various leaders and in the case that we're talking about now, Bashar al-Assad, once he's demonized and it gets repeated and repeated, what we hear is um, whenever the media, almost every time the media and and as you say, Human Rights Watch, and even some people in the progressive community mention Assad's name, it's always preceded by the term brutal dictator. And it seems to me that um, we, have to, we have to recognize that this, this sets up a, an opportunity to basically dismiss anything that is said that count, contradicts this standard narrative. So you've mentioned this, this chemical attack in Duma. There have been other alleged chemical attacks. From my perspective, the most obvious thing is there is no motive from the point of view of the Syrian government that gives it any benefit to doing the chemical attacks. All of the motive gives the benefit to the opposition forces, which when we were in Syria were unanimously, everybody said they're just terrorists. That's, that's the way to describe them. Mm. And, and despite the fact that there is no benefit, in fact, the, the contrary to the Syrian government, we're constantly told that this brutal dictator just loves to kill his own people. So I'm wondering if you can say something about um, whether can say something about the change that the, 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 I think it's important to say something about the, the demonstrations that took place in 2011, because from the perspective that I gained in Syria, there were some legitimate complaints about what was going on. And the government responded uh, ultimately in changing the constitution. Can you say something about that? Just, it, it, to me, it's, it has to do with the quality of, of the political life within Syria and also how people see this president, um, Assad. Well, I mean, I think when you talk about um, legitimate opposition, of course, there is legitimate opposition. And we met with members of that opposition. And I regularly speak to members of, you know, both official opposition parties, but also people that are effectively opposed to the government in one way or another. But what they're even more strongly opposed to, of course, is, is the funding of armed factions inside Syria to overthrow the government and in so doing, to actually murder their own people in the process. Um, and many people that I will speak to, and I will quote, I, I will paraphrase Dr. Nabi Antaki, who's a gastroenterologist in Aleppo, who said, of course we want change, of course we want reform, of course we want to see some progression in our society, but we're not going to um, kill our own people in order to achieve this. And I think, you know, um, as I, I will come back to the Muslim Brotherhood and I will come back to the fact that the uprisings here began um, in February 2011 to mark the anniversary of, of course, the putting down of the Hama uprising, um, which is always portrayed in the West as um, President Hafez al-Assad brutally 
massacring the poor Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, what it doesn't talk about is the mother Muslim Brotherhood being instrumentalized, as I said, by the US, by the UK, and that was proven in the DIA release documents that were released in 2015. Um, it was proven um, prior to um, the 1982 put down of the Muslim Brotherhood uprising that the uh, Muslim Brotherhood factions, the armed factions, um, entered the cadet college in Aleppo and they massacred um, a number of Alawite students there. Um, now there were at this time, and why this is important is to demonstrate the, the fabric of Syrian society that you witnessed as well when you came to Syria in 2016, is that there were Sunni um, Muslim cadets who refused to leave their Alawite comrades and to join the Muslim Brotherhood. They were massacred at the same time by the Muslim Brotherhood. Why is this story important? Because it demonstrates exactly what is going on now. What happened leading up to 1982 is pretty much a, a repeat spin cycle of what we're seeing now. And at the same time, back in um, the late 70s, before 1982, um, the Muslim Brotherhood took over an area of Hama. They declared it um, a separate Islamist caliphate, in a sense, if you like. Um, and of course, I mean, that you know, any self-respecting government, if, if, for example, somebody, a, a, an extremist group were to occupy areas of Washington and say, well, hello, we're turning this into an autonomous region, of course, Americans would respond and the American government would respond to that. And that is exactly what happened with Hafiz al-Assad. He responded to um, a campaign of um, suicide bombings, car bombing attacks in Damascus on an almost daily basis leading up to 1982 when they occupied Hama. Um, and again, the DIA document has confirmed the fact that uh, whereas Muslim Brotherhood and Israeli and US propaganda will state that tens of thousands were killed in the putting down of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uprising. In fact, the DIA document itself states that only 2000 were killed uh, in the final campaign. But of course, what it doesn't mention are the numbers of Syrian Arab army and civilians that were killed by the Muslim Brotherhood leading up to, to that crackdown on Muslim Brotherhood violence. Coming forward to 2011, we have an almost repeat of this whole performance. The Muslim Brotherhood were weaponized. Again, this has been clearly um, declared in the DIA documentation um, to overthrow the Syrian government. In history, we know the UK involvement in the manufacture of the Muslim Brotherhood movement um, and the use of the Muslim Brotherhood as a kind of battering ram. We saw it in Egypt and we're seeing it in Syria. Um, they are weaponized by the US, by the UK, in order to impose um, a dark age. Mm. You know, Peter Ford, who was the UK ambassador here in Syria um, in between 2003 to 2006, I think, um, he has stated publicly that when he was here in Syria, um, the UK administration perceived Bashar al-Assad to be reformist, to be progressive, to be a positive influence. If we go back to 2003, the Bush-Blair communiques, um, where Blair and Bush were discussing, you know, maybe they can create a different relationship with Syria, meaning they, they can bring President Assad on board and avoid another um, regime change military operation. Of course, we know that that failed because why? Because President Assad refused to abandon the Palestinian issue. He refused to abandon Hezbollah. He refused to uncouple himself from his um, defense uh, agreement with Iran. Um, and he basically refused um, the Qatari, Turkey, US backed uh, oil pipeline in favor of the Iranian pipeline, which of course was backed by Russia. And so, you know, in, in, in the Western prism of understanding, he committed at least five of the deadly sins, not to mention, of course, 
um, his uh, commercial ventures um, with China, um, the Five Seas Project, the Belt and Road Initiative, et cetera, et cetera. So Assad represented um, a serious threat to US global supremacy. And of course, as soon, whenever I mention US, I always assume the UK is in partnership with the US. I never see the two as being separate. Right. One of the one of the things that we're aware of is this project for a new American century, which you've probably seen. And uh, it was revealed in a number of ways, one by General Wesley Clark. And that when when he heard about it, he was totally surprised. It was in the early 2000s. He was in the Pentagon and he was totally surprised because he was told that the US had plans to overthrow seven countries in five years. And Syria was one and Libya was mm -hmm. one and Iraq and Iran was one and Lebanon was another. Um, in, in, uh, from our perspective in the Peace Council, we saw the stepping stones to Iran as being the big player in the Middle East that the United States wanted to uh, overthrow and Syria was on that on that but so was Libya can you say something about the uh, can you say something about the link between overthrowing Libya and weaponizing these uh, these terrorists in in Syria um, well I mean I mean many of the terrorists of course um, circulated from Libya and into Syria um, so effectively um, the the terrorist groups that were um, inside Libya um, entered Syria um, and were used to power multiply um, the Muslim Brotherhood factions inside Syria very early on in the conflict. And of course, you also had, I mean, the main backers of the Muslim Brotherhood are Turkey and Qatar. And of course, Turkey was largely responsible um, for uh, the incubation, um, the funding and the arming of many of the terrorist groups, like, for example, the al Tawid Brigade, that was the... Um, um, brigade that initially invaded Aleppo in 2012, because of course Aleppo was um, loyal to the Syrian government and refused to enter into any of the protests that were being um, uh, orchestrated inside Aleppo itself. So then it was decided, of course, that um, the Tawid Brigade would invade um, East Aleppo largely in 2012. Um, but what we're seeing now, of course, is the percolating of terrorists from Idlib, which has been described as the largest Al-Qaeda haven since 9-11 by Brett McGurk, um, from Idlib by Turkey into Libya, but also um, to uh, occupy the border regions in the northeast, ostensibly to protect Turkey against a Kurdish invasion. But of course, effectively, what they're doing is annexing um, Syrian territory using um, the Al Qaeda affiliated oh, terrorists from. So basically, what you're seeing here is is Turkey um, using the terrorist groups that it controls in Idlib to carry out its its dirty work in Libya and in the northeast, and quite possibly right now in um, Azerbaijan and against Armenia, of course. So. One, one of the things <laughs> in this country are unaware of, uh, not that it's private, it's not concealed, it's there, it's just that they're unaware of it, is that back in about 2014, uh, then Vice President Joe Biden was speaking at Harvard University. And mm -hmm. he was asked a question about Syria and he walked away from the podium and then went, went candid. And this is available on YouTube, you can see it. And what yeah. he does is he states very clearly that the problem in Syria is our, our allies, US allies. And he mentions Turkey by name and he mentions Saudi Arabia. And I, I think he mentions Qatar as basically funding, weaponizing and training these terrorist groups. 
Al Qaeda and ISIS and so forth, you they have they have many names the, the di different uh, different groupings, but he admits this, and that was very candid and off 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 the mark as far as uh, the Ad Obama administration was concerned. So that later that day he was told by Obama you have to apologize to our allies, which he had to do, but that recording is there, so mm. it is it is an admission. On, on, on many levels that the United States and its allies, these allies are not working separately from the United States and the UK, they're working uh, hand in glove with them, that they were and are and continue to weaponize, support, train these, the, the opposition forces. Um, and one of the things we learned is that, that the main conduit for the movement of terrorists into Syria was through Turkey. So Turkey has, can you say something also about how Turkey not only became a conduit for moving terrorists into Syria, but also a conduit for the theft of Syrian assets and selling them through Turkey? Oil. Sure. I think I think just going quickly back to Biden, of course, he also admitted that um, effectively the US had been funding ISIS while claiming to be fighting ISIS. And we have to remember that the US coalition and the UK have boots on the ground in Syria ostensibly to fight ISIS. I mean, you know, America has a military base at Al Tanaf, um, which is close to the Jordan border. It's occupying Syrian oil fields on the basis of fighting ISIS effectively. Of course, what it's doing is providing revenue for its various proxies, which include the SDF and ISIS. John Kerry in 2016 in a closed session in the UN um, admitted that they had hoped that ISIS would be, you know, a, would flourish and overthrow the Syrian government, which is effectively an admission that, that ISIS is another instrument of the US inside Syria. Um, it's been documented that, that ISIS was um, fostered, let's say, um, by um, America and the UK. Um, ISIS has carried out a number of massacres like um, the massacre in Sweden in 2018, which it moved across the desert to carry out uh, one of the worst massacres of this war. Um, under the surveillance of the US military base in Altanath. I mean, I'm, I mean, I've digressed slightly there, but I think it's important to make the point that, that while America is claiming and the UK is claiming to be fighting ISIS, in reality, ISIS is another weapon um, used by the US coalition. I mean, they've, they've airdropped vast quantities of weaponry, supposedly, of course, to the so-called moderate rebels, but those moderate rebels, even Robert Ford, former American ambassador to Syria, has admitted that the Free Syrian Army is working with ISIS, right? Um, there, there, there's video footage of uh, Free Syrian Army commanders admitting their collaboration with ISIS, and yet those weapons are supposedly being dropped only to the moderate rebels, like the, the train and equip program, but of course, strangely, those weapons, um, those anti-aircraft missiles, those um, heavy, heavy artillery weapons end up in the hands of ISIS and are used against the Syrian Arab army, of course. You know, and I've completely forgotten what the question was, <laughs> sorry. Well, it, it, was, it was how, um, how Turkey not only supplied yeah. terrorists, yeah. but also allowed the terrorists to sell yeah absolutely uh, equipment and so forth well i mean not only allowed I, th I think this was a deliberate policy by turkey i mean for example in aleppo when um the armed groups um invaded and of course the majority of those armed groups um were at the time sponsored and funded by turkey um because turkey always perceived aleppo as its prize of this war um, and um, much of the industrial equipment was dismantled and stolen and re-established in Turkey. Um, train tracks were taking, uh, 
um, electrical power grids, all the equipment was taken and taken to Turkey and re-established. Um, I mean, the industrial theft by Turkey from inside, and not only industrial theft, the, the theft of artifacts, the, the, the theft of heritage, of course, all of that is, is a orchestrated campaign that the terrorist groups destroy um, essential infrastructure to um, disable the Syrian government's ability to service its people, basically, to provide food, to provide water, to provide electricity, to provide fuel, um, but also to destroy its heritage and history. I think um, when I met with the director of um, the Damascus Museum, I mean, something insane, like more than a million artifacts have been stolen out of Syria during this war. And, you know, this is a very, very familiar um, playbook. Again, we see the destruction of history and heritage, the destruction of infrastructure, the theft of resources and the imposition of sanctions. And Turkey's industrial theft is a part of that. Equally, of course, um, when ISIS was stealing um, the oil from the Northeast, it was coming to Turkey and actually it was Erdogan's son that was then selling it on to Israel. So Turkey, I, I, I mean, Turkey's role in the destruction and destabilization of Syria is, is criminal. It's beyond criminal, actually. Um, it's the actions of a neo-Ottoman-led rogue state um, effectively um, using the terrorist groups, predominantly Al-Qaeda, as its proxy to annex um, Syrian territory as it's doing right now still in Idlib and in the northeast on the border as I mentioned and at the same time using these terrorist proxies to to siphon out industry um, infrastructure uh, as I said even um, railway track is being taken and melted down um, by Turkish um, metal factories and sold on even, I think, at one point in Aleppo, um, the terrorists were taking the pistachios and those pistachios were being sold tax-free to France by Turkey. So, just, I mean, just to give you an extent, that there's not one, you know, even, even the olive plantations that are um, affected, a huge part, I think 50% of Syria's olive production is occupied um, by Al-Qaeda-dominated groups. And so... I mean, everything from agriculture to engineering to, to um, essential resources is being bled out of the country by Turkey. Of course, not without the agreement of the US and the UK and other NATO members, because we shouldn't forget that Turkey is a NATO member state. So this, this brings up uh, in my mind, um... Uh, another another question, which was the which which goes back to this the, the whole the whole justification for um, uh, invading Syria <clears throat> directly as we see now, but indirectly through these proxies and these terrorist groups, and that is that is the overthrow of the Syrian government and. And one, uh, one of the things we're advertising in this webinar is how the White Helmets played a role in this demonization and in this, in this process. Here we're, we're given this um, uh, story that the White Helmets basically save people from the bombed out buildings that, uh, that, that the <laughs> Russians and the Syrian government have destroyed and uh, they are protecting people. They're, they're uh, saving them from being smothered or murdered or whatever. That is what we're being told. And, and part of that, it seems to me, is, is that, the, that the Syrian government is not only allowing it, but taking part in it and encouraging the killing of its own civilians and the white helmets are the saviors of the day. So say something about the white helmets and the background, because you have done a lot of work on this. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, basically, um, 
as I said to you, um, if people want to check out the film The Veto, which will talk about the early fabrications, um, basically what happened in the beginning of the conflict, um, a group called Avaz, which people will know as a petition site, um, but in fact what it is is a sort of public opinion harvesting site amongst other things, and it's an integral part of the hybrid war strategy. Um, particularly that which is being waged against Syria. Um, but Avaz originally um, kind of set up um, a, a platform called Bambuser, where all of these armed groups and citizen journalists could feed in their information. Now, I'll cut a very long story short, but basically what was happening, they were feeding um, their footage in CNN and Al Jazeera and BBC and Channel 4, et cetera, were picking it up from Bambuza and they were taking what they needed and using that as a live report. Now, what the, unfortunately for them, what they didn't realize was all the footage was loaded to Bambuza. So in fact, we could see the setting up of the scene by the various citizen journalists. Um, and then the little section that CNN, for example, would take out, of course, bore no relation to the fact that, that they were orchestrating these reports. So then I think in 2013, British intelligence basically said, OK, we need plausible deniability. We need something which is going to produce the propaganda, which is going to give the media a break because they're actually being rumbled right now and people are seeing through um, the lies that are taking us to war in Syria or proxy war in Syria. And so um, um, a British uh, Foreign Office funded group, uh, Analysis, Research and Knowledge, ARC group, um, which had um, amongst its staff, James Lemazurier, um, a former um, British military intelligence agent who had worked in a number of NATO intervention um, countries such as, for example, former Yugoslavia, he'd been stationed in Kosovo in 1999, etc. cetera. Um, he was tasked um, to found the White Helmets and the White Helmets were founded <laughs> in Turkey and in Jordan. Um, and they were effectively created to produce or to support um, the demonization of the Syrian government, the Syrian army and its allies. Um, there are British Foreign Office, UK Foreign Office documentation stating very clearly that they rely heavily, if not entirely, upon white helmet evidence to corroborate their foreign policy, basically. Amnesty International Human Rights Watch are almost uh, entirely reliant upon the document or the the, the testimony from the White Helmets. And the White Helmets um, have been instrumental in the manufacturing of the chemical weapon narrative. And if again, we come back to Duma, of course, um, it is proven that the hospital scenes in Duma were manufactured. I myself was on the ground in Damascus when the alleged Duma attack happened. An interesting story, particularly for an American audience, is that the day before the attack happened, I had gone on a media tour of liberated areas of Eastern Ghouta, and in my group was Frederick Pleitgen of CNN. Um, so Frederick was with me when we visited a number of what appeared to be chemical weapon laboratories under control of the various um, terrorist groups in Eastern Ghouta. Um, we saw cylinders very similar to the ones that we saw in the images from the alleged Duma chemical weapon attack. And on the day of uh, the actual alleged attack, Pleitgen went live to CNN and did not mention a single thing about what we had seen the day before. And immediately, of course, jumped to the probable conclusion that it was the Syrian government and the Syrian army that had carried out the attack. So just to give an indication of how, um, how they manufacture these narratives and how they lie by omission, because effectively Plotkin gave no context to that whatsoever, right? And, and I myself have been in Syria when chemical attacks or, or low grade chemical attacks have been carried out by armed groups against civilians in areas where I was. 
I've been to hospitals, I've interviewed civilians who've, who've received either some low level, low grade chlorine compound, um, but have suffered serious respiratory problems as a result. And yet those attacks are never talked about. They are never picked up. They are never mentioned in mainstream media. They're completely ignored. And you know this, um, the amount of ignoring of Syrian civilians by Western media is extraordinary. In fact, the majority of their narratives come from uh, the White Helmets and other sort of subsidiary groups. But effectively, the White Helmets are embedded exclusively um, with the armed groups, dominated, of course, by Al Qaeda in almost every area that, are, that were occupied and are occupied by the armed groups. They leave always with the armed groups on the buses when the Syrian government negotiates amnesty and reconciliation with the armed groups and they leave um, in the past, of course, they've always left to go to Idlib. Um, and the White Helmets have predominantly left with them. Um, I've interviewed both uh, active White Helmets and former White Helmets. Um, they have effectively informed me if a leader of a White Helmet group is Nusra Front, the entire group will be Nusra Front. It's a sectarian organization. It's not inclusive of other um, religious minorities inside Syria or even moderate Muslims. It's a sectarian extremist group. And even James Lamazurier, the, the founder who died in Istanbul in November last year in mysterious circumstances has admitted it's a sectarian group. So it's a group that was established by um, British and American intelligence. It's funded by the majority of the governments that are invested in uh, regime change inside Syria. It is tasked with providing the propaganda. In their book, they document war crimes, but uh, the White Helmets have never documented a single uh, armed group war crime inside Syria. One would assume if you're looking at their record of documentation that the armed groups have never carried out any war crimes against the Syrian civilians. And of course we know that that is a lie. Um, so effectively they are an outreach agent of um, US, UK intelligence to give a humanitarian um, cover for the armed groups and to provide um, the evidence to criminalize the Syrian government. I mean, that I, I'm simplifying it and I'm not going into depth about their own war crimes or their own um, involvement in war crimes and executions and torture and imprisonment, detainment, et cetera, et cetera. Do they exist in government controlled areas at all? No. And they took on the they took on the name Syrian civil defense. Is that yeah? Is there a Syrian <laughs> civil defense that you can you know that doesn't include the white helmets? No, I mean effectively that's another very important point. I mean the the white helmets are a shadow um, a shadow state organization in the sense that they've usurped the real Syria civil defense that was established in 1953. Um, it's the only Syria civil defense recognized by the ICDO, the International Civil Defense Organization in Geneva. Um, that's on record. Um, and of course, the real Syria civil defense is currently serving 85% of Syrian territory that is back under the protection and control of the Syrian government and Syrian army. Um, it is, it comprises if I enter um, um, a center of the real Syria civil defense, I will see Druzi, I will see Shia, I will see Christians, I will see Sunni Muslims working together in the same center. You will never see that in the white helmets because as they, I say, and this is a very important point, they don't represent the inclusivity of Syrian society. They don't represent the, the multi-faith mosaic that is Syria. And, you know, as I say, again, you witnessed that when you came to Syria. The White Helmets do not represent Syria. And if you speak, you know, when I was speaking to Syrians recently liberated um, in East Aleppo, when I actually said to them, do you know the White Helmets? They looked at me blankly. Then when I said, well, they're doing this and that, they, oh, you mean Nusra Front Civil Defense? 
And that's literally, I mean, if, if you walk out in the street now and speak to any Syrian in the street and you mention the white helmets, they'll say, oh yeah, it's Nusra Front. <laughs> so, so this is, uh, I mean, this is, but, but of course the, the um, we are, we are completely awash in how wonderful the white helmets. Can you say something about, because this, I want to get into the relationship between Israel and Syria and understand that the white helmets were evacuated by Israel uh, under circumstances mm. where they were going to be overrun <laughs> by the Syrian government forces, but also to say something about how, in, in, you know, how Israel has dealt with this, has, has been involved in this war. Mm. Well, I mean, I would ask how many of your audience know that there was an Israeli attack here two days ago um, on the air defense um, base, literally uh, five kilometers away from me. Um, and three Syrian Arab army soldiers um, were killed. Um, I guess, you know, I didn't. Exactly. It, it's not newsworthy. N Western media will never pick this up. And yet it's a regular, if not monthly um, event here. Um, usually coinciding um, with Syrian Arab army advances against the armed groups. So that gives an indication of who Israel is supporting in this fight. And of course, um, there have been admissions, there have been admissions from um, Israeli um, defense administration and also um, governmental officials um, that they've been treating um, the terrorists in Israeli hospitals, that they've supplied weapons um to the terrorist groups um they've admitted that they would prefer to see um the armed groups even isis in control in syria than um president assad and the current government um and recently there's been um an admission um that they were actually effectively coming into syria and communicating with the armed groups in the south now when I actually investigated um, the extradition of the White Helmets that was facilitated um, by Owen Kotler and the Canadian administration, Christian Freeland, um, I actually visited or I followed the route that they took. Now that route took me to the border fence um, of the um, occupied territories of Golan um, and quite extraordinarily, there was an entire hospital that had clearly been there before. They, and, and there was still the sign for it, but the entire building had been taken down. All that was left strewn on the ground were Israeli supplied equipment, hospital equipment, medical, um, you know, medicines, et cetera, it's strewn on the ground. Um, and I was told by people there, actual people living in a, in a small sort of refugee camp there, they said, yeah, actually, this was an operating hospital for the terrorists. But then when the White Helmets left, Israel basically dis dismantled the whole thing, took the building itself, but of course, left all the equipment strewn on the ground. So, you know, Israel, Israel has a vested interest. Um, in getting rid of a government that effectively uh, supports Palestine um, is against uh, the Zionist entity. And of course, Syria has a history of um, war against Israel anyway. Um, but no, I mean, Israel effectively is another um, arm of the terrorist groups here. I mean, other stories that I often heard um, <coughs> is um, they would um, protect and give cover for the terrorist groups when the Syrian army were trying to liberate areas in the south. Um, so, you know, Israel, Israel is utterly invested in this war for a number of reasons. Of course, the, the main one um, is to prevent any land access to Palestine for Iran and Hezbollah. So it's very important to Israel to, to prevent what they perceive as Iranian expansionism rather than US and UK expansionism forcing Iran into a war in Syria in order to protect. Of course, both Russia and Iran, if you like, 
are here in Syria at the invitation of the Syrian government. But they are also here because they are well aware if they don't contain um, these terrorist factions, of course, many of them foreign, many of them international, many of them Chechen, many of them the Uyghurs from China, um, Iranian extremists or extremists that could threaten um, Iran. So there is an interest for these countries to contain everything inside Syria and to defeat it inside Syria to prevent it spilling out um, and, and entering their own territories, of course. Say something, because you mentioned the Palestinians, and it's clear that there are, there are groups in the United States, <coughs> uh, these groups in the United States that are in solidarity with Palestinians. What is the relationship between Palestinians and Syria? How did Syria treat the refugees? How were the Palestinians uh, involved in this, uh, in this war? Mm. Um, well, I think, again, it's very important um, to point out on the basis because the, I think the entire Palestinian movement has been um, destabilized and, and fragmented. Um, by the war against Syria, um, because many of them have been um, misinformed about the situation for Palestinians inside Syria. And I will give um, two examples that I hope demonstrate what I'm talking about. Um, when East Aleppo um, was liberated, um, the main uh, Syrian Arab army brigade that was involved in that liberation was Liwa al-Quds, which is Palestinian. So it's a Palestinian arm of the Syrian Arab army. And effectively, they were liberating areas of Aleppo where their families um, lived. So Liwa al-Quds, um, there's a very, very good uh, documentary made by Anna News, which consists of a lot of interviews with Liwa al-Quds commanders. And I, I, I can't remember the name of it, um, but if you just put in Anna News Aleppo, I'm sure it'll come up. It's about an hour long, but it's well worth watching. Um, and the other thing is <clears throat> One of the major propaganda um, narratives that was used to turn the Palestinian support movement against Syria um, was the Yarmouk camp. Now, first of all, I have to say that Yarmouk camp um, and other Palestinian refugee camps, as they are called in, in Western media, were not camps. They were suburbs of um, Damascus, or Yarmouk certainly was. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't only inhabited by Palestinians. Palestinians and Syrians, um, you know, lived side by side amicably for years. Now, what might come as um, a shock to some Palestinian uh, supporters is that the reality of this situation is that it was Hamas, um, Muslim Brotherhood, who allowed uh, Nusra Front and Nusra Front affiliates to enter Yarmouk camp and to start actually turning on um, the Syrians and the Palestinians, the Palestinians that were loyal to the Syrian government. And of course, um, loyal to the fact that Syria had actually provided them um, with residency. Um, Palestinians are have exactly the same work rights in Syria as Syrians, basically, which of course is not the case in other countries that Palestinians settled as refugees. Um, the only reason that they were not um, given um, uh, citizenry is because uh, is to protect their right to return. Um, so effectively, they have the same rights as any Syrian citizen, as far as as far as I know, inside Syria, from Palestinians that I've spoken to and Syrians I've spoken to. So in Yarmouk camp and in um, the majority of the Palestinian camps or, or suburbs throughout Syria, Hamas were responsible for the destabilization of those camps. Hamas were responsible for working with Nusra Front and allowing Nusra Front to enter and to occupy those areas and to drive out um, the Palestinians and Syrians who, as I say, remained loyal to the Syrian government and to the country that had given them safety and um, uh, um, livelihood. 
Um, the Syrian Arab army was responsible for the safe evacuation, of course, of um, civilians, both Palestinian and Syrian, who were trying to leave the area. Um, I would highly recommend reading uh, Shamin Nawani's report from on the ground. She visited all of those refugee camps and spoke to people inside them. Um, I think it's called Stealing Palestine. Um, and it, it, I highly recommend reading it. It's long, it's detailed, it's based on a lot of interviews. Um, Hamas was responsible from day one for a lot of the destabilization of Syria. It was responsible for the digging of the tunnels um, strategy that it learned from a former ally, Hezbollah. And of course, um, in Syria, it turned against both Iran Hezbollah and against Syria. We shouldn't forget that um, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership was given shelter in Damascus. Um, it then, of course, decamped um, to, to the Gulf states. Um, and uh, effectively, Hamas has been sadly responsible for a lot of the destabilization inside Syria. So the Palestinians who were refugees in Syria were basically treated as Syrians. Yeah. And and the the attacks on the Syrian government are from these from the United States, which has never supported the Palestinians or the UK. Uh, the attacks well i mean i think i i think in the in the us a lot of the um like the syrian american council syrian and syrian american medical society are heavily infiltrated by muslim brotherhood so of course they are heavily supporting the muslim brotherhood factions inside syria which as we we know um even from um uh Jeffrey Sachs's um, announcement referenced Timber Sycamore, of course, that these groups were being used by the CIA to destabilize Syria and to overthrow the government, power multiplied by the US, um, strengthened by terrorist groups brought in from outside um, that were better equipped and better armed, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood um, role in this war against Syria is, is huge. And the support that it receives from organizations, uh, funding, um, promotion, um, platforming, et cetera, by organizations, um, both in the UK and in the US are incredible. The, the Muslim Brotherhood lobby in the US is unbelievably powerful and it is influencing public opinion particularly the palestine movement opinion um reference syria sadly um we've covered we've covered a lot what we what we haven't covered really uh and and you know we've we've skipped around a bit but what we haven't we haven't totally covered um the sanctions sanctions Before we <laughs> talk about that uh, <laughs> i have a couple of questions that people have asked mm. and one of the one of them is the the um use of syria and use of the 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 different forces that are are involved in syria the outside forces that are involved in syria is it part of is it part of the new Cold War, for example? Is it a part of the new Cold War against Russia? Is that is that uh, is that what uh, U.S., U.K. and allies are doing? Is as a way to create antagonism, weaken weaken Russia? So let me let me stop with that. Uh, mm. A couple of other questions. Um, of course, yeah. I mean, I mean the. I don't think the Cold War ever stopped. <laughs> I think it just died down and it's just re-emerged now. Um, and of course, look, for Russia, um, Syria has been, if you like, a triumph, both militarily, um, politically, diplomatically. And this can't be ignored. Of course, Russia perceives 
um, Syria as its partner in the region. And of course, we've seen the expansion of, of a pre-existing naval base in Tartus. I mean, it's been there for, um, I think, around 50, 60 years anyway. But of course, now it will be expanded. Um, Russia now stands to um, gain both on, you know, it's going to be investing in um, um, restoring electricity plants and restoring power grids and so on. But is it part of a new Cold War? I think it's, it's, an, it's a part of an ongoing battle for global supremacy and hegemony. And of course, what we've seen forming inside Syria is uh, an axis of resistance, which of course is Iran, Hezbollah, Russia, um, Syria, China to some extent, probably from a trade point of view, certainly, right? Um, even countries to some degree like South Africa, Czechoslovakia, Poland, you know, South Africa has kept its uh, embassy open in Damascus throughout the war. Um, they now have an ambassador who is actively trying to find ways to circumnavigate the sanctions and to encourage trade between South Africa and Syria. Um, and so I, I think what you're seeing is the growth of the threat to US UK dominance globally, right? And so I'm not so sure that it's, it's, it's necessarily a new Cold War. I, th I think it's, um, I think it's a war against the axis that has formed to combat what is happening inside Syria and Syria, you know, has been the catalyst for that. And it's something, oh, I, I don't know if there's something positive that can come out of all of this destruction and devastation and suffering and poverty and bloodshed, then if something can be built that has a positive influence on all our futures. You know, because a world that is governed by one power is a world of global insecurity. And I think, you know, that's a very important point to make about the OPCW. It's not necessarily about Syria or about America or about any particular nation here. What it's about is a, is a global organization that is there to police chemical, the use of chemical weapons. And it has been shown to be corrupt and compromised and lent upon by those that are sponsoring and funding it. And this is, I mean, this is something that can tip us. This is an organization that will have a global influence and we're seeing it to be fraudulent. And this is something which affects all of global stability now and in the future. And I think for, for any thinking human being, we need a world that is multipolar, not unipolar. We don't need a world that is governed by a, a criminal bloodthirsty administration that is the US, which of course is backed by UK intelligence and the, the UK basically. Um, their only goal is to destroy countries in order to plunder them. Yeah. At least we see um, with Russia and with China, we see a degree of um, symbiosis. They're working in partnership. Of course, they're going to benefit. Anyone in a business deal is going to benefit, right? But at least they're benefiting on the basis that Syria will benefit also. And, you know, um, I think one of the main reasons that Syria has resisted for this 10 years. One is the stability of the state and the government and the leadership. And, you know, I was speaking to actually a member of the opposition only a couple of weeks ago when the forest fires were raging. And he even agreed with me. He said the one thing that has kept Syria alive during this war is the stability of our government and our state and our leadership. That's the one thing. The second thing is the strength of the allies and the strength of the alliances that Syria has formed and has developed through this war. And that is what will take her forward, of course, and that is what will help her um, to circumvent the sadistic sanctions that America and the UK are imposing upon Syria. And of course, the sanctions have increased incrementally with their 
failed military campaign as the Syrian army uh, and allies have advanced and taken back Syrian territory and effectively beaten back um, an army of terrorists, mercenaries and well-equipped soldiers. And it, that's another point to make. The Syrian Arab army is the Syrian people. It's a conscript army. It comes from the people. Um, it's poorly equipped, poorly armed, in the sense that it certainly doesn't have any of the state-of-the-art equipment that has been given to Nusra Front, ISIS, uh, all of the proxy groups on the ground here, right? Um, but as the military campaign has effectively failed, of course, the economic campaign has ramped up and the sanctions have become more and more uh, sadistic, more and more savage, more and more barbaric. The hybrid war strategy has increased the burning of crops, the burning of olive plantations. Um, Trump's uh, dropped thermal air balloons onto the wheat and barley crops in the Northeast. Um, in the South, Israel deliberately set fire to, um, to crops in the South. Um, we suspect that many of the armed groups are setting fire to the crops throughout Syria. Why? Because, of course, if you can uh, reduce, if you can't reduce a state to a failed state militarily, you can try to do it economically and you can try to orchestrate food insecurity. You can occupy the oil fields, not necessarily because you need or want the oil. Of course, it provides revenue for your proxies, but because you don't want the Syrians to have it. Why don't you want the Syrians to have it? Because you don't want them to have fuel. You don't want them to have heating. You don't want them to have electricity because you want to turn them against the government. Right. You want to create a, a, a level of frustration and starvation, misery, poverty, frustration that turns the people against the government. I mean, I honestly have to say it's not going to happen because as desperate as people become here, they know that their only chance of, of getting out of the abyss that the US coalition has thrown them into is the current government and its alliances. It's an interesting, uh... I'm glad you, you spoke about the effects of the sanctions. I remember in 2016, with many of the people that we met in civil society uh, across the board, lawyers, university people, health people, and so forth, uh, all saying, what can you do to stop the sanctions? And as I understand, the sanctions have gotten multiply worse yeah. since then. The, the United States primarily has imposed sanctions on a tremendous number of countries that uh, it hasn't, it, some of them it has invaded and others it's simply waiting for the, the, the country to collapse. Uh, mm -hmm. Venezuela is one, Cuba is one that has suffered sanctions since 1960. So the sanctions are, are, are part of this, as you say, hi, as, as people say, hi, hybrid warfare what um, one of the one of the things you've mentioned a number of documentaries, and I would like our our participants to be able to access mm. those. Uh, someone I can send the links. One actually, one thing I wanted to just quickly yeah. come back to, if I can, on the sanctions because it's an important point, <laughs> particularly for Americans. Um, it's the fact that you know when you hear the American administration or the UN talking about maintaining the flow of humanitarian aid, that humanitarian aid is not coming into the 85% of Syria that is restoring itself or trying to restore itself under punishing sanctions. It's coming in to areas like Idlib, well, effectively only Idlib right now, um, that is governed and controlled by Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda affiliates. Now, Kelly Clark, the, the, I think it's Kelly Clark, the US ambassador to the UN, um, visited um, the Turkish-Syrian border areas, and she actually was very close to Bab al-Hawa. Bab al-Hawa is an Al-Qaeda hub. I mean, this has even been reported in mainstream media. This is the area where Al-Qaeda 
um, generate their income, their revenue. Now they generate their income and their revenue with the UN supplied humanitarian aid that is coming into Bab al Hawa. Now Kelly Clark, if you listen to her, she will tell you that the, the, the cross border operations must continue because they are the only things that are keeping civilians alive inside Idlib. No, effectively what they're doing are keeping Al Qaeda um, in control in Idlib, because what happens in all these situations where there is an occupation by these armed groups, any humanitarian aid entering those areas are taken and stored and controlled by the armed groups, in this case, Al Qaeda. They are then sold at extortionate prices to civilians. Civilians are last on the list for humani any humanitarian aid that comes into any area that is governed by armed groups. And the UN and the US coalition are only supplying aid to areas that are governed by armed groups. So that needs to be made really, really clear here. The sanctions are on every aspect of Syrian life. So they are on education, on agriculture, um, on hospital sectors, on humanitarian sectors. There are hospitals that cannot treat cancer patients here because they can't repair the machines. They can't get the parts in from Europe. Um, there are uh, premature baby units <laughs> that can't keep running. And yet, how many hospitals in Idlib do you see with premature baby units that are operating, right? Um, the terrorist enclaves in Idlib receive some of the state of the art medical equipment into their hospitals that are run by organizations like Syrian American Medical Society, um, occupied by the armed groups. Again, we saw this in East Aleppo. I've seen it in the liberated areas in Idlib. I've been to Sarakeb, um, to Marat al Numan in Sarakeb. I entered the hospital and there, there were Sam's boards all around the hospital, and yet it was occupied. Um, by Al-Qaeda and affiliates. And so all of this so-called humanitarian aid is effectively coming in to sustain the armed groups, right? And this is a very important point to make so people understand and can differentiate between UN humanitarian aid, sanctions, and when they tell you that, yeah, but you know, we don't, we, sanctions don't affect the humanitarian sector. Yes, they do. I can tell you they do. Hospitals here. We have lost our connection to Vanessa and um, she warned us, uh, she warned me anyway, that she, she might lose her connection because the, uh, the laptop had a limited amount of battery supply. So it's lasted for about an hour and a quarter, and that was about it. She may uh, return in a few moments via cell phone for her. Uh, Vanessa has not, not returned. Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated for doing so and also for your questions. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to close this this uh, webinar and uh, we will try to get answers that we have not been able to get to or questions we have not been able to get to uh, and get them to people as, as best as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa Bealy for this very important presentation.